Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of this video is standing waves. It's a new topic for you grade 11s. Um, and specifically we're talking about something called standing waves with two fixed ends. So in this video we're going to talk about what exactly these standing waves are and how are they formed. We're going to look at how to do some calculations with them and then we're going to look at an application so you'll see how it connects with the real world. Uh, one thing I'm starting to do in the videos is put a, um, a clipping of your homework schedule at the bottom of each video so you can see exactly where we are. We're in lesson four now. We're working on section 8.1 but we're only dealing with two fixed ends and you'll see what I mean by that shortly. The work to do before class along with watching this video is perhaps to read section 8.1 and take some notes and look at some examples. In class we will be working on these textbook questions. I will do a demonstration for you. At some point we'll be doing a lab which is in your course pack. More on that coming up. Uh, stay tuned in class. And then after class you can continue working on textbook work <coughs> Excuse me. Or, uh, and as well you can finish writing your lab report. And uh, don't forget to mark that due date for your lab in your calendar so that it doesn't catch you by surprise. All right. Anyway, let's get started. What I'd like you to do is think of a guitar, a very common musical instrument. It has six strings, this guitar. The strings are held in place at the, at the tip here and also at this end here. And I'm not a guitarist, so I don't know the names of these parts, but uh, whatever they are called, you can imagine this as a string which can vibrate and it has two ends that are fixed in place. So once again, they are fixed right here. So we call that a fixed end. And also, I should probably use another color there. Right there, there is another fixed end. Okay, now I want you to consider what happens if you pluck the guitar string. This would be kind of like taking a slinky and stretching it out, holding it at both ends like we do in class during our labs, and then sending a pulse all the way down it. What would happen? Well, if you sent a series of pulses, not just one pulse but many, then a whole bunch of crests and troughs would begin moving from one end to the other. These would be the crests, letter C, these would be the troughs, letter T, and so on. They would begin moving and eventually they would reach the fixed end, which on a guitar is here or here, and if it's in class with a slinky it's the place where someone's holding on. Now here's a diagram from your textbook. This is Physics 11 by Addison Wesley. Figure 8.9 in this section, they don't draw the wave like this, they just draw the C's and the T's. So that's what these letters represent. And these crests and troughs are alternating, alternatingly moving toward the fixed end. Of course the distance between a crest and the very next crest is one wavelength, or if you prefer, the difference between a trough and a trough is a wavelength. And therefore the distance between a trough and a crest is half a wavelength. Now they show in diagram A the wave is approaching the fixed end. In diagram B the crest that was here has arrived and hit the fixed end. Now when you, uh, next time you play, along, play around with the slinky in class and you send a wave pulse all the way down to one end and it reaches let's say the person, your lab partner who's holding on to it, what you're going to notice is that if that person sends a crest then when the wave bounces back it will flip and become a trough. In other words it will reverse its phase. That's why this crest which was on its way in in figure A has now become a trough in figure B and it's reflected so this arrow shows that it's on its way back out. Meanwhile, this trough that was on its way in behind this crest is still on its way in. It's right here. It's still inbound and so what's going to happen? Well I think you can see by these two arrows these two troughs are going to meet. They're traveling at the same speed so they're going to meet in the middle. In other words, they will meet two troughs one quarter of a wavelength from the end. That's because they're separated by a half wavelength to begin with for this reason over here that we discussed previously. What happens when two troughs hit? You get what's called an antinode. What is an antinode? Well, think back to when we learned about wave superposition and you learned that a node or a nodal point is a place where everything cancels out and so there's zero amplitude. Well, an antinode would be the opposite of that. 
this is a place where things add up like two troughs and you get a big big trough, a super trough or the opposite of a node, an anti-node. Anyhow, the, the outgoing trough continues moving and what happens next? It hits the next incoming crest which is actually this guy here in the original diagram. Using similar logic that helped us understand why two troughs meet here, what you end up with is a trough and a crest over here, half a wavelength from the end. And of course that gives you zero amplitude, a crest and a trough, and so you get a node. And so they've written the word node here. And this process continues on and on as long as you or someone else keeps disturbing the medium, keeps sending waves along the slinky. Now what ends up happening is kind of cool. You end up with this. You have the waves coming toward one another, a red wave and a blue wave shown here. At some point they overlap so that all you get are crests with crests or troughs with troughs, crest with crest and so on. And that reminds us of the situation right here where you get an anti-node, constructive interference. The result is very tall waves, much taller, larger in amplitude than either of the waves that went into making them. So these are the separate waves here, but these are the resulting overlapping waves. A short time later the waves have moved on and now we have crests meeting troughs. Crests meeting troughs. And of course that leads to cancellation, so you get just a flat piece of uh, slinky or whatever the material, the medium is. In other words, just zero amplitude. Of course a short time later the waves have moved further and now they are doing what they did back in part B. Similar idea, you have your super crests and super troughs, your anti-nodal points, very large amplitude vibrations here. And then back to nothing. So I'm going to demonstrate this for you in class when you come in for the lesson. That would be this part of the homework schedule here where it says demo standing waves in a spring with two fixed ends. But if you want to go right now, pause the video and go to YouTube and see if you can type in standing waves, you'll see what, uh, what we're going to observe in the demonstration uh, upcoming in class. Okay, So that's how these standing waves form and what they're all about. Now the interesting thing is that because of what we looked at over here where one quarter of a wavelength from a fixed end you get an anti-node. And because a half wavelength from a fixed end you get a node, and of course at a fixed end you get a node as well, this end cannot move, it's held fixed in place, you end up with this alternating pattern and what it ends up looking like is the following. You can have a wave that's got a fixed end here and a fixed end here and it might look something like this alternating between nodes and anti-nodes, you'll end up with very large amplitude vibrations looking like this and these correspond to what we looked at right over here, the resulting waves that have very high amplitude. And of course, now I can't draw this moving in real time like a, like a movie. If you want you can watch a YouTube video about standing waves but this, uh, this alternating pattern of super crest, super trough, and then nothing, which would look like this, this will continue back and forth. You'll go from very large waves to nothing and then back again many, many times. We'll see in the demo tomorrow. However, uh, one of the rules is that at a fixed end, you have to have a node because obviously the medium can't move there. So at fixed ends there's always a node. And every half wavelength you end up with another node like this. So these are one half of a wavelength apart. And these are your anti-nodes. Anti-node, anti-node. These are your nodes over here. 
and we call them standing waves. And they can actually form in any number of different patterns. For example, you could create a uh, standing wave pattern that instead of having three of these half wavelength pieces, it might have just two, and it would look like this. This is a possibility as well. In this case, you'd still have half a wavelength in between nodes. However, you'd see that these waves are slightly longer in wavelength than these ones. These are shorter wavelength, these are longer wavelength. And what we call these are different modes of vibration. Sometimes we call them different harmonics. And if you're a musician, you might recognize that name, harmonics. That is because when we make music, we're vibrating something with a musical instrument, like a guitar string, and the harmonics refers to how the instrument is vibrating. So what I've done for you here is to <clears throat> at least start a chart. And what you can write in here, for example, is the name of the pattern. You can draw a picture. You could write in the number of loops. By the way, loops are these things in here. So let's just go back for a sec. A loop, there's one, there's another loop, and there's another. So this one has three loops, whereas this one only has two loops. A loop is a half wavelength. It's the distance from a node all the way to the next node. Okay? So you could write in the number of loops, and you could also write in the number of wavelengths. This is the number of loops. Okay, and what we're going to do here is we're going to draw the first few patterns. So I'll complete my chart here. So as an example, let's get started. Uh, one of the ones we drew was this. This pattern of a standing wave caused by reflection. Oops, sorry, that was the... Uh, what was I going to do? I'm going to cut this and just paste it somewhere else. There we go. That's the picture. The name is actually... We have a name for this. This is called the second harmonic. Uh, second harmonic has two loops. It looks like a full wave. It's a full wavelength. It goes from the start all the way up, down, and back again. So that would be one wavelength. If there's a second harmonic, there ought to be a first harmonic. What is the first harmonic? Well, that would be this one here, which has actually just the two nodes at the fixed ends, as opposed to this one, which has three nodes, two at the fixed ends and one in the middle. Uh, how many loops here? Just one. How much of a wavelength? Well, this one looks like it's only half a wave to finish this wave, you'd have to go that far, but we don't have that much space in this wave. So this is actually one half of a wavelength. Continuing the pattern, you would have the third harmonic, which again, at fixed ends, you have to have a node. This one had a node in the middle. That one had zero nodes in the middle, so zero nodes, one node. This will have two nodes somewhere in the middle. And the way this one is drawn is like this. This is actually one of the pictures that I drew on the diagram over here. All right. So all these patterns, any one of them can form when you pluck a guitar string. This one, of course, having three loops. Which one forms depends on how you pluck the string and the musical instrument and a whole bunch of other things. But the point is that when they form, they vibrate they create a certain wavelength of wave, and of course in music that wavelength is related to the frequency which is related to the sound that we hear. So 
if you play a musical instrument, <clears throat> it can create lots of different beautiful sounds all at the same time. And these are what cause us to say, hey, that guitar or that piano, uh, piano is also a string instrument, by the way, it's got strings inside of it, uh, that instrument sounds really cool. Just to finish off this pattern, how many wavelengths have we got? Well, here's a wave starting, going up and down, down and back. So what do you see here? That's a full wave, plus there's more of a wave. There's actually an extra half wave. So this is one and a half wavelengths. So I hope you guys see the pattern forming here. Uh, what have we got? First harmonic, one loop. Second harmonic, two loops. Third harmonic, three loops. The number of loops is the harmonic number. The number of wavelengths, well, for each loop you get half a wavelength. So one loop, half a wavelength. Two loops, a full wavelength. Three loops, one and a half, or three halves. Uh, this is one, or two halves. One half wavelength, two half wavelength, three half wavelength. There's a pattern there. I guess I have to finish up in the next five minutes. It's almost uh, the start of my next class, and I will do that very shortly. That was the bell there. Uh, another pattern that you might notice, this one has two nodes. This one has three nodes. This one has four nodes. Uh, you could also look at the number of antinodes. This has one antinode. This one has two antinodes. And here we have three. I'm running out of room here, but oops. Antinodes. I can still spell. Antinodes. There we go. And finally, just to finish off, they have a name, another name for the first harmonic for all you musicians out there. This is called the fundamental mode. This is also called the first overtone. This one's called the second overtone. So if you hear those names being used, you know what they mean. So just to finish up completely, because I got to get to my next class, here's a question out of your book. Question four, I forget what page it's on, let's find out really quickly. It's on page 296, question number four. A wave on a rope has a wavelength of 20 centimeters. So that means that every time you see this, that represents 20 centimeters, the distance from one node to another. It says one end is fixed in place, so we know we're dealing with the kinds of standing waves that we just studied. Question A, how far will the first three nodes be from the fixed end? So let's draw that wave. Here's what a standing wave would look like going on and on from a fixed end. They're asking how far will the first three nodes be, so let's make this look like a standing wave. Well, here's a node. The first node is right at the fixed end, so zero centimeters. Here's the next node. How far will it be? And here's the third node. Well, if we know a full wave is 20 centimeters, then let's just draw out full waves here. Here's one full wave. That's 20 centimeters. So I hope you can quickly see that this point in the middle will be halfway, 10 centimeters, this one will be 20 centimeters, and so on. And finally, part B, how far will the first three antinodes be from the fixed end? I'll do this in a different color. You've got 10 centimeters from here to there, so an antinode, which is right here, that's going to be half of 10, which is 5 centimeters. Another 5 will get you to the first node, and then another 5 will get you to here, the next antinode, that'll be at 15 centimeters, and I'll leave it to you to keep going to find out where the third of the antinodes is. Here's an antinode right there. All right, folks, I apologize for rushing things, but I did want to get this video up to you before the day gets any further on, because I won't have time later. Any further questions we will take care of in class. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.